At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Martha Kirilidou. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Martha Kirilidou, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the last of our six webcasts on the LibValue IMLS grant. Today's webcast is on the digitized special collections, and um, uh, I do want to thank you for joining us and cover with you a couple of logistical things. Everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We do welcome questions. Please type your questions. There is a Q&A uh, button there, and we stand ready to answer all of them and questions and answers that we do not answer, as well as those we address during the webcast will be distributed to attendees after the webcast, along with the recording that will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. I would like to take a minute to introduce uh, the uh, colleagues that are with me here today and that will be uh, featured in today's webcast. Uh, we have the pleasure of having with us today Gail Baker, Professor and Electronic Resources Coordinator at the University of Tennessee Libraries, and Ken Wise, Associate Professor at the University of Tennessee Libraries. Actually, Ken will speak first and then, and then Gail. And what we are going to try to cover today is the following goals. We want to identify how we can articulate and measure the value of digitized special collections. Uh, we want to demonstrate how contingent valuation can be used for this purpose. And also identify how Google Analytics can supplement value studies for digitized special collections. We did mention that this is the last of six webcasts, and they, all these webcasts are on the LibValue IMLS grant. And uh, a word about the grant, it is an effort led by two copies, Carol Tenopier at the University of Tennessee and Paula Kaufman at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, they have pulled together an amazing team of um, uh, researchers. It, the uh, project involves multiple institutions using multiple methods to measure multiple <coughs> types of values for different stakeholders. And uh, our partners include uh, uh, researchers from the University of Syracuse. We've uh, included in uh, this um, work some of the GISC collections projects that uh, Carol um, Tenopier is um, uh, working with, and none of this would have been possible without the support of um, IMLS. Now, we do view that the university mission and goals define how the library operates, and we also uh, realize that there are uh, at least three key distinct uh, elements in the library's role um, in serving the university, one related to teaching and learning, one related to research, and a third one related to social and professional aspects. And a lot of the projects we have engaged speak to different aspects of, of these three uh, elements. Now, ARL has a history of developing tools for the library uh, community. We have branded the Stats Crawl Gateway as a platform where we collect uh, a lot of data. We have a data collection that's uh, going back uh, more than a century, even before ARL got established. The ARL statistics, this is the annual descriptive statistics, and they started back in 1908 um, when Gerald was a university librarian at the University of Minnesota. And these statistics served um, a, a valuable purpose for a good part of the previous century. However, their importance is being displaced, and over the last 20 and more intensively over the last 10 years, ARL engaged in uh, exploring different protocols, and some of these protocols actually have become sustained uh, operations that libraries use extensively. 
LibeQual, a tool for measuring library service quality, for example, has been used by more than 1,300 libraries nowadays on a global basis. A climate qual, an internal staffing survey, has been used by many libraries to identify the organizational culture. And we have two protocols. The DigiQual protocol was a research project funded by the National Science Foundation to explore aspects of um, uh, electronic, um, of digital library service quality. Uh, and uh, the Minds for Libraries protocol, which uh, is operational currently, and we are engaging with a number of libraries implementing it, focuses on measuring the impact of networked electronic services. And uh, as you will see, um, both DigiQual and Minds um, relate to some expect, to some uh, respect to the um, digitized special collections uh, because uh, both of those uh, protocols uh, are developed for the digital environment. Mm. Now, focusing more specifically on special collections, though, there is a recognition by um, many libraries in the field and many colleagues have articulated of the increasing importance of special collections. I want to highlight here a piece that recently came out uh, as an, the inaugural piece of a NIFECA SNR uh, briefing series. It is written by Rick Anderson at the University of Utah, and it's entitled, uh, the title of it is Can't Bias Love, The Declining Importance of Library Books and the rising importance of special collections. Now, in there, Rick highlights that the distinction that will shape our future is the distinction between commodity documents and non-commodity documents. Commodity documents are the everyday books that everybody can buy uh, from the bookstores, from Amazon. Now, he also goes on to say that special collections, which are primarily the non-commodity documents, will bear heavily on the utility and health of an academic research library. And acquiring and digitizing and making discoverable special collections enriches the scholarly environment. A lot of what Rick highlights in this um, interesting briefing piece has also been articulated through the ARL profiles that we collected a few years ago and um, we analyzed and Right here you see on this slide uh, the cover page of the report, um, ARL Profiles, Research Libraries 2010. In there, the, the narratives each library provided to us uh, showed that there are some overarching themes uh, about research libraries and their role in uh, the current century. They do serve the public good. Uh, they have a global role. They do work on setting standards and exploring best practices, and they have a key role in establishing national and international visibility. Now, through those uh, narratives, we did uh, uh, do a further analysis focusing prim primarily on the digital developments libraries highlighted in those narratives, and we presented that uh, at a conference a couple of years ago, and the three elements that uh, were identified uh, in those narratives was uh, the acquisition of digital content, the development of digital services, but as you can see there, the top uh, circle there is about the digitization of uh, special collections. Now, um, in those narratives, we have seen that um, the focus on digitizing special collections is on the distinctive materials and the signature collections. And uh, uh, libraries mention a variety of media, photographs, newspapers, films, audio, manuscripts, postcards, multimedia. And there are um, digitization models that uh, vary from the large-scale uh, digitization that has resulted in things like the Happy <coughs> Trust to smaller efforts like curated online exhibits. Now, we also gleaned through those narratives some of the reasons of why libraries are digitizing special collections and some of these 
are outlined here. They support undergraduate learning, which is something I think a few years ago, or definitely in the earlier century, it wasn't something, uh, you know, special collections were not thought of as something that would support undergraduate learning, but increasingly it, it, it serves that role. Uh, other um, uh, reasons is to provide remote access to collections, to expose hidden collections, to further the library's mission, to enable long-term preservation, to respond to user preferences, increase the discovery and use of these resources, and, of course, attract new donations. Now, before we uh, go into the, Ken's very interesting uh, piece of the presentation, I do want to ask you a poll question, and uh, I'm going to go here and pose the poll question to you so you can see it in your um, screen. And while uh, you see it in your screen and you vote on it, I'm going to read it to you. And what we are trying to ask you here is to select the most important value you think is created by your digitized special collections. And these, of course, are not mutually exclusive, but um, please try to choose one that you think is the most important. So these are, there are six that Ken and Gail identified in this poll question. The number one is the user value, the value to the user in terms of time and money spent. Number two is the element of prestige, the prestige to the institution from high visibility digital special collections. Number three, development, value that accrues to the development effort of the institution. Number four, environmental value, value of the environmental savings from uh, limited physical access to unique and, uh, and to unique and fragile material. And uh, uh, number five, is the value to scholars, the value that accrues from the role of special collections in attracting, for example, graduate students and retaining faculty, of course. And number six, collections, the value of digital collection in attracting additional special collections. So I want to see uh, whether you are voting. Yes, you are voting in uh, some of these. So. I can show you the results, and I'm pushing here the results to you. So you can see that uh, the majority of you voted as the most important, 40% of you voted as the most important, the value to the user in terms of time and money spent. Uh, then the second most frequently voted category was prestige, and uh, the third one was scholars. Uh, so with uh, this, and without further ado, I would like to um, move us on and uh, uh, ask Ken to join us and talk okay. about how we can evaluate some of these <coughs> aspects. Ken. Thank you, Martha. I appreciate that. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is, uh, is met methods for measuring what we might call the, the value or the return on investment uh, in online digital collections. I'd like to begin by pointing out that with the, with the rapid uh, pace of digitization, where all but the most obscure items will be you know, universally available to all of us anywhere, anytime, some observers of the academic scene have suggested that the academic research library has increasingly become an, an anachronism, kept alive by nostalgic sentiments and for the prominence of big buildings in the middle of campus. Now, this sense of increasing irrelevance has generated a, a demand for libraries to show proof of worth. And research by Stephen Town appears to demonstrate that Academic libraries' measure of its contribution to the academic, academic community is demonstrated at only two bottom line measures of worth. One is financial or related measures of value, and the second one is impact on research and ultimately on research reputation, and to a somewhat lesser extent on teaching and learning. 
Now, these dimensions reflect two lines which have been developing recently in library assessment. <clears throat> One is the quest for impact, and the second for value measures. <clears throat> now, in 2009, as Marty pointed out, with a consortium of the University of Tennessee, University of Illinois, and Syracuse University received a grant from uh, IMLS to demonstrate possible impact and va value measures by in investigating return on investment in academic libraries. Now, LibBall, is, as this project is known, entails seven separate research projects assessing the return on investment of various functions within the academic enterprise. Now, three years prior to us starting the LabVal project, John Lombardi, while he was addressing the library assessment conference, raised the following question. If everything is digitized, then perhaps the relevant measure of distinction is whether we, in our university library, capture, maintain, and contribute digitized copies of unique materials. Now, the operative word here is the relevant measure of distinction. And as a response to Lombardi's question, one of the key components of the LibBell project became that of identifying what John Lombardi called the relevant measure of distinction. In particular, we are attempting to assess the beneficial returns on resources invest invested in the digitization and online access of special collections and here at the University of Tennessee Libraries. And in our project, the basic data for estimating the return on investment valuation was gathered through an economic methodology called contingent valuation. And these contingent valuation findings were then uh, collaborated with data that was guarded from Google, Google Analytics. And in 2012, Carol Kenneper published an article uh, beyond usage, measuring library outcomes and values. Now, in and of itself, the title, Beyond Usage, suggests that until recently, much of the discussion of the benefits of library collections and services had been restricted to use value. In our search, we were attempting to look beyond use value to a value measured, uh, value measure that economics, economists called option value, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Now, use value, correctly measured, flip to the next slide if you will, okay. Use value, correctly measured, indicates the value of collections to patrons who actually make use of the collections and services. Generally, it is a measure of an individual's maximum willingness to pay for access to these collections. However, this method me measurement alone significantly underestimates the actual value patrons place on these collections and services. And that's the distinction we're trying to make here. Use measurements ignore the potential, the value to potential users who value the option of accessing library collections in the event that they require access. Such users place a value, which economists call the option price, on the right to access these collections in the event he or she needs them. Now, stated more simply, though a patron may not use a collection for many years, he or she may still place significant value on the right to access these collections. Now, to look at it even in a more simplified matter, manner, uh, many of you may have a toolbox at home which you've got a collection of tools in it, and there are probably some tools in that toolbox that you never use but you still value those tools in the sense that they're there if and when you need to use them. And it, it's something similar to that that we're getting at. David Hartness and Frank Allen were the first two to demonstrate that significant value resides in, in reference services. They uh, uh, surveyed a reference department. Even for patrons who may not have used the services, and furthermore, that this value the option value is measurable. Now, the idea of option value was initially introduced by an economist named Burton Weisbrod, and he used it in reference to economic amenities that can't be valued through the marketplace. 
Weisbard points out that the option value concept arises when an individual is uncertain about whether he or she would ever make use of a specific amenity. In the case of a librarian, a library's collection, a special collection, the patron may be uncertain about when or how often they might access the collection. When this uncertainty exists, the appropriate measure of the total value of special collections is the value of the individual's maximum willingness to pay for access before the uncertainty about use is resolved. This use this value under uncertainty is called the option price. All right, use value in the traditional sense measures the maximum willingness to pay for use of the collection by individuals after the uncertainty is resolved. That is, they know they want to use it. Option value of any collection is calculated as the difference between the option price and the use value, a measure that estimates the value to non-users, that is, people who do not use the collection. The fact that some individuals have a positive option price but never exercise it is totally irrelevant. In other words, even for those who rarely or have ever accessed the digital special collections, the collections may nonetheless be intrinsically value to, valuable to them. Now, it, it's this option price that is the appropriate measure of the benefit to users, whether they are potential or whether they are active. So, how do we measure the option value? There are no markets for the buying and selling of online digital collections in which we can directly determine the value in terms of a sale purchase price. Well, that's usually how we determine value is uh, uh, the arm's length transaction between a buyer and a seller. Uh, there is no market in special collections. A special collection, like any other library service, may be considered a public or a quasi-private good for which there are collective property rights. For example, the citizens of, citizens of the United States own uh, Grand Canyon and Yosemite National Park, and thus they have a right to hike and to camp in its wilderness. Unlike pure private goods where the cost of purchase explicitly indicates the monetary benefit of the good to the purchaser, public and quasi-private goods like Grand Canyon and the Yosemite are not exchanged in the marketplace. And thus, the benefit to an individual consumer or user or patron is not readily revealed. Similarly, a library special collections is a quasi-private good in the sense that members of the university community own the right to research the collections, but the property right cannot be sold. Now, in some circumstances, the value of quasi-private goods uh, not explicitly traded may be directly inferred from market transactions. And what I'm trying to get into here now is, is exactly how uh, the contingent valuation method works. Now, consider, for example, the value individuals place on the privilege of let's say, living in a safer neighborhood. Since there are no explicit markets in safer neighborhoods, there is no means for directly determining an individual's willingness to pay for living in a safer neighborhood. Nevertheless, willingness to, uh, willingness to pay can be indirectly inferred by examining the sale prices of all houses and extracting the premium that people are willing to pay for those houses that are in areas with safer neighborhoods versus those in less safe neighborhoods. And look at, you're looking at the distinction, the difference between the, the two prices. In many instances, however, it may be difficult to infer willingness to pay values from transactions in explicit markets, even in, in, uh, in the case of inferring it. Now, under these circumstances, we have determined that the contingent valuation method affords a useful means for estimating or determining the needed values. 
Our contingent evaluation methods incorporate carefully designed surveys to elicit willingness to pay for improvements or to avoid degradation in public or quasi-private goods. Because the theoretically ideal method for measuring benefits would be based upon individuals' preferences revealed in you know, direct arm, uh, arm's length market, market transactions, contingent value uh, methodology, methodology establishes a hypothetical market in which the surveyor survey participants act as though they are purchasing goods. They pretend they are purchasing goods under consideration, thus revealing his or her valuation of the goods. So what we're getting at here is the contingent valuation uh, method is really a hypothetical market that we set up is to see how people will respond uh, when given a choice to buy something they really can't purchase. Now, without getting into the theoretical justification for uh, contingent valuation methods, let it be sufficient here to say that, that contingent valuation uses survey questionnaires to elicit it, the individual's preferences for public goods by finding, out, by finding out what they would be willing to pay in dollars amount for suitable alternatives, that is, contingent situations. Now, the LabVal... Uh, study that uh, Gail Baker and I completed was done uh, here at the University of Tennessee Libraries, and we're a state-supported uh, institution in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the university's Hodges Library maintains the online digital special collections selected for the evaluation assessment. And we picked uh, four of them. Uh, one of them was the William Cox Cochran Photograph Collection, and, uh, and the other one was the, the Albert Dutch Roth Digital Photograph Collection. We also uh, uh, used the uh, from Pi Beta Phi to Aramont collection, and the uh, and also the Thompson Brothers digital photograph collections. And all of these, you can flip uh, one more slide. All of these are part of the uh, University of Tennessee's Great Smoky Mountains Regional Project. And at the bottom there, you can see a, a link or a URL uh, will take you to, uh, to essentially to all of the uh, digital projects that we have. Uh, particularly the four I just outlined. Now, those are the four that we included in the uh, in the uh, the questionnaire or the survey uh, for uh, trying to assess the value. Now, our survey model was uh, was modeled after a questionnaire used by Harless and Allen in their study of of reference services. We kind of took that as a baseline. And uh, looking at the example right here is good. You can see that we began. Uh, uh, the survey with kind of a brief description of the methodology and how we're going to proceed. And then we went into questions concerning uh, uh, a user's familiarity with the specific online collection being measured. Now, here the question, and this is just an example, did you know that the Albert Dutch Roth digital collection is, online, is hosted by the University of Tennessee? And we would substitute one of the four or two of the four, whatever was was. Uh, was relevant for that particular uh, person into this question, so we could have uh, the draft collection or the Thompson collection or the Pi Phi collection or any combination of those. Once we had uh, asked that question, we proceeded uh, with another set of queries, and one was uh, first we wanted to ask about their level of satisfaction with the content uh, in these uh, uh, online uh, websites the level of satisfaction with access, and uh, through the, the frequency of access uh, to the collections. Now, jumping a, a, oh, wait a minute, back up. Thank you. Too far ahead. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're in the right place. Okay. Uh, jumping uh, ahead uh, a bit here, let me mention that all but two of the survey participants were very satisfied with the content of the collections. Uh, the remaining two were satisfied. And with the exception of one dissatisfied respondent, the responses to the quality of online access was fairly even across the very satisfied and satisfied spectrum. The frequency of access ranged from one week, once a week, to twice a year. Now, this information was very helpful, but it's all ancillary uh, uh, to the real question. To create the hypothetical market and directly connect responses to willingness to pay, 
We move to the next page of the questionnaire and question six, where we ask the patrons to specify how much they would be willing to pay for online access to the collection if they were not freely available. Now, question six is the critical point of the survey. This is the question that we were trying to get an answer to. Now, in contingent valuation studies, some participants initially refuse to answer the question or, or uh, respond that their maximum willingness to pay is either zero as a protest response. In this circumstance, such respondents were taken through a separate set of questions. Now, you can see here if they answered B, C, or D, it directs them to an X1, a Y1, or a Y2, to, to another part of the survey. Uh, they were taken through another set of questions and statements in order to persuade them to participate if they had initially refused to answer. Now, you can see this, uh, those individuals who responded with zero or nothing or who refused uh, to offer willingness to pay to ask a series of questions to identify the reasons for their responses. Now, affirmative response, did you say zero or nothing because that is what access to the online question is worth to you? It is counted as a willingness of zero. An affirmative response to the other question, did you say zero or nothing because you thought we were asking you to begin paying for access to the collection? Or did you give this answer because you think the University of Tennessee should be able to provide access or spend too much money on the online collection, prompts the interviewer to read a short statement addressing the concerns, re-examining the willingness to pay question, and as you can see from this page of the questionnaire, inviting the respondents to answer the willingness to pay question again. All right, the entire questionnaire is very long. And in fact, it's too long to show in its entirety here, but I hope from the next couple of pages to illustrate the sifting process by which the contingent valuation survey asked patients to make comparisons, um, look at contingencies, and ultimately reveal to us their maximum willingness to pay for access to these collections. First, if the respondent honestly thinks that they were being asked to pay for access, the questionnaire prompts the survey to X2, which is the screen you see right here in front of you. Here the survey explains that the collections are supported by state funding and the state and student tuition, but that they are being asked for their willingness to pay were the access not free. In other words, it's a hypothetical market. What would you pay if you could not get to it free and we're not asking you to pay for it? Similarly, if a respondent indicates that they do not what they are do they do not know what they're willing to pay, the questionnaire prompts to Y1, where, as you can see, uh, uh, it addresses a set of the most likely objections before being directed elsewhere in the question. And so uh, the, the surveyor would work through each of the objections trying to find out where the sticking point is for, this, uh, for the participant and work them back uh, uh, into ultimately getting back to something to question six or something similar to question six, their willingness to pay. For any given response, a, a well-constructed contingent valuation survey should continue having the respondent making comparisons, making consider and considering contingencies until arriving at some level of willingness to pay for access to digital collections. In the, as you can understand, it's a hypothetical market, so we're trying to get these people to compare and, and uh, contrast and uh, consider contingencies in order to come with some price that they are comfortable with. In the end, half of the respondents indicated that users are willing to pay at least $10 per month for access to any of the four online collections identified in the survey. Two respondents valued access to the collection at zero, and another refused to cite a figure. Uh, some examples here, one respondent indicated a willingness to pay as much as $20 per, $20 per image if they were permitted uh, to copy the images or to even to request copies for the images. Three respondents indicated they were willing to pay $5 per visit, uh, some $25 per year, and another $10 to $20 per year. So take
taking all these figures and all the data and using even the most conservative averaging of the responses, users of the four, line, four online collections are willing to pay in the neighborhood of $5 per month for access to the collection. Now, that sort of gets you the value part. Now, we've got to look at, at, at the cost. So the estimates of the cost of creating and maintaining access uh, to the contents of the four online collections refer referenced in the uh, survey were approximated by measuring the cost of creating a small, separate, but similar collection of Great Smoky pho Mountain photographs known as the Paul Adams Photograph Collection. It, it only has 25 images in it, and the 25 images were scanned and correlated with the metadata by a student worker in less than two hours, and the online access were created by a technician in less than one week's work. Uh, while these images may be easier to digitize than certain other special collections material, the Adams Project nevertheless indicates that the cost of digitizing and creating online access is not excessive. Upon release, the Paul Adams online collections referred to favorably in a blog. This is sort of a, an accidental thing, but it was on a blog on the Great Smoky Mountains. And the following day, the site registered over 700 hits, uh, extrapolating the estimated $5 willingness to pay over the 700 hits results in a measurable benefit over the cost. Now, if one assumes the value of an online special collection is limited only to that value determined by actual usage, it follows that the total willingness to pay would not be higher for individuals who do not use the collection. The concept of option value, however, suggests that the willingness to pay value is more meaningful than the actual usage value. Infrequent or non-frequent or non-users of the online collections know that the access exists and are willing to pay to ensure that the service is available when the need arises. It can also be surmised that infrequent researchers are likely to be the more unsophisticated users of online access and who need and therefore willingness to pay is greater. Now, in our study, Gail and I focused uh, our survey on youth value, trying to measure actually the non-users. But there are other important values of special collections that cannot be measured in the marketplace and thus lend themselves to contingent uh, valuation methodology. And you saw all of these, all of these in, the, uh, in the poll question. As I pointed out earlier, one of the two bottom line measures of work is impact on research, or more explicitly, research reputation. Reputation, or as I call it, prestige, is in our case, might be the question, what is the prestige to the institution for high visibility digital special collections? Similarly, there is a measurable value in the worth of a library's special collection to a university's, university's development efforts. What value accrues to the development effort of the institution? Again, we can frame questions for estimating the value from an environmental perspective to that of attracting scholars to the institution and for building a reputation that will help attract future collections. Uh, in the case of the environment, you can see the question might be, what is the value to the environmental savings from limited physical access to unique and often fragile materials? For scholars, the question might be, what value accrues from the role of special collections in attracting graduate students? And from a standpoint of collections, the relevant question would be, what is the value of digital collections in attracting additional special collections? Now, this latter question invokes what is known as the Matthew effect. It's a sociological dictum that predicts how advantage begets further advantage, or how the rich get richer, or in our case, how the prestigious collections become even bigger and more prestigious. Now, if you look back over these six uh, uh, values that I've listed, and remember uh, we're talking in, uh, in contingent valuation about trying to measure uh, 
beyond the user, that is, trying to measure <clears throat> the non-user. You can see how uh, people who are interested in development, who are interested in building collections, who are interested in the prestige element, may not necessarily be users of the collection. The collection is valued to a de development office, for example, in the sense that they can, can promote the university and promote the library and raise money, even though it's highly unlikely the development office is ever going to use a collection. Similarly, people who are going to build collections, uh, knowing that they've got a, a good collection already there, a prestigious collection, uh, are, are going to try to go out and uh, acquire more collections and uh, but they probably may not ever be users of the collection today, but the current collection has great value to those people. As many of you indicated in your survey, prestige was the, uh, the number one vote in uh, which of these values is most important. Prestige to a university, uh, the people who market the prestige and, and uh, who uh, advertise the university. <coughs> Uh, like having the collections there for value purposes, but again, they may not be users. So regardless of which of these values or others that are important to a library's operation, Gail and I feel that contingent valuation represents a promising approach to measuring return on investment over a range of values that do not, in sense, that do not include uh, uh, active users. Now, now Gail is going to pick up at this point and talk about how we apply this data to uh, uh, at Google Analytics uh, and uh, how we went forward with that. Gail. And, and uh, just there are a couple of questions if we can uh, get them uh, and uh, can either both you and Gail can can um, uh, respond to these. Uh, one coming to us from the University of Michigan, Helen Luke is asking, how does your option value allow for people who wish to promote and support the common good? That is the needs of others. How does our collection do it? How or the option value is the is the option value taking oh, into account value. in any way um, the uh, the case of users who want to promote the common good? Well, okay. Um, hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, you're t what the question is trying to do is how could we value the common good? Uh, and it, it, the survey would have to be designed in such a way you sort of elicit uh, whatever that com how you're going to define the common good uh, and how you place a value on that. And the, what, what most in likely would have to happen is that the survey would have comparisons in there. For example, uh, you would have to say, okay, this is a common good, and this is a common good, and this is a common good, and this one's a common good. Which one do you have a greater preference for? And have and, and get some sense that uh, where the hierarchy is, and then try to narrow it down, which is really what the survey does. It gives people these choices, and they, they, they start to rank until you find out where the common good ranks within all the other options that they have for all the other contingencies. That's the methodology you would have to use. It would be a tricky one. Yeah, yeah. It Real would tricky. be. It's a very, very interesting question. Um, now, uh, another one, it, it may not be as, as hard and... and uh, um, it says uh, when we, we I did mention that in the beginning one of the findings we found um, regarding why libraries make uh, special collections available is the ability to provide remote access to some of these resources and the question is how are you providing that access vis-a-vis -vis copyright protections and intellectual property law so how are some of these how are some of them of the copyright protections and um, intellectual property law relate to uh, some of the special collections? Okay. Uh, in some cases, we have uh, all the copyrights to do whatever we want. We can reproduce, we can sell, we can. Uh, uh, we, we have the rights. In others, the rights are somewhat limited. Uh, we cannot uh, to, to deal with a commercial enterprise. For example, we get uh, hotels and, and restaurants that, that 
tall and say, you know, we'd like this big smoky mountain scene to put up on our wall. In those cases, we refer to who has given us the collection or who holds the copyright. But in all, in, but but we do secure the rights up to where we can can give them to nonprofits, to scholarly use, for publication, and so forth. And uh, it's just an agreement that we have to get with each of the donors as to uh, what they're comfortable with uh, rights they're willing to give up. But and I think in all cases uh, we have, except maybe one, uh, we can uh, distribute them in every case except uh, uh, for commercial use. Very good. Gail, yeah, do you get, want to? No, you get it when you get the collection. Yeah. Thank you. Gail, do you want to respond to either of these? Anything more? Well, I think I might have in uh, my area some, something about environmental savings uh, with with the online use. I mean, it's, it's very similar to the types of uh, savings and values that... Uh, people look at when they look at online courses and all we're saving in time, money, uh, as far as travel, uh, you know, impacting the environment, that sort of thing. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a few slides yeah, from now. Yeah, it, it does. And we do have a poll question uh, for uh, the audience. Does your institution value your efforts to digitize special collections? I just pushed that question out there, and uh, um, hopefully the answers are coming back. Let me take a quick uh, look. Oh, yes, uh, everybody uh, is coming back. I'm going to stop uh, the question, and I'm going to um, show the results to our audience. And uh, we see that, uh, yes, uh, resounding yes, 76% uh, indicated uh, that um, uh, the, the digitization of special collections is being valued. Uh, so, Gail. Okay. Uh, if you would go to, I guess, a couple of slides beyond uh, where you are now, to slide 41. Uh, for image collection data gathering, our plan was to use uh, three different methods, survey, log analysis, and interviews. Our survey uh, did not uh, generate a very good response rate, so we moved on to focus in log analysis, and we're hoping that the log files, which serve as a history of events on a server, would give us uh, more information. And then we were going to use, we used the log files to help us identify prospective uh, subjects for Ken's uh, contingent value work. Deep log analysis, a uh, lot of data elements, uh, IP addresses, uh, date and time stamps, uh, IP address of the user, which I found very interesting uh, and, and used. Referring URL, which gave us some idea of what, uh, where the user got, uh, got uh, the link or the direction to get to the digital image site. On the next page, uh, on this page that you can see a search, uh, you, uh, referring URL, and then you see news readers and, and metadata. Uh, when I started asking for more information about the IP range, our technical folks said, you need to look at Google Analytics. So I promptly started reading about it and uh, got some help, uh, some additional programming help just to add the JavaScript that needs to be put in the header uh, on the uh, various web pages used for interacting with digital image collections. When that code was executed, a log record was stored at Google and a cookie was set on the user's browser to be checked later to see if that uh, user returned. Uh, when I wanted to see analytical reports, I logged into Google Analytics to the URL that you see there. And I did not have to depend on the programmers after that, which was helpful because I could, could interact with the Google Analytics just fine. There are pros and cons for using 
Google Analytics. Uh, one of the best ones is that it's free, and I guess for now. Uh, the reports provide some very useful information about visitors, uh, number of page views you get. Most of the information is aggregated for certain uh, slices of the, the uh, user's sessions. And also we've got average page views, average time viewing pages in a session, new return visits, and bounce rate. Now, bounce rate is something I had to learn about. It's the percentage of visits where only one page is viewed before the visitor exits the site. It does have, Google Analytics does have some flexibility. Dates can be changed uh, to cover specific time ver periods, and visitor information can be displayed by day, week, or month. Uh, one can also add uh, another metric to do uh, to look at perhaps visitors by country and then add a second di dimension with the type of browser they're using. Or you can exclude records that meet certain conditions, like I would want to exclude all visits whose bounce rate is greater than 50% something like that, and it makes for very interesting reporting going on. If we want to go to the next slide, the cons, it's not a web log. You can't get to individual user informa or visitor information. It only records when JavaScript is encountered. Uh, if a browser does not allow cookies, you don't know. There could be many people like me who I clear my cache and cookies all the time, so the visitor category may not be correct. Uh, we ended up uh, putting up a privacy policy on our website to state that we used Google Analytics to improve our web pages and that uh, cookies... Uh, are used for Google Analytics and directing them to uh, disallow cookies if they don't want their usage tracked. The other, the last thing is Google has the data, and given what's been on the news, some may wonder who else might have that data too. Uh, if we could move on and start looking at the reports, here's the dashboard report. I'm sorry it's kind of blurry. The colors are pretty, but I will uh, tell you that we uh, are looking at the dashboard report for the Roth collection for June of 2012 through the end of May 2013. Uh, 3,491 visits by 2,653 people. This is the largest collection with over a thousand uh, images, so uh, this ha has is our highest use collection in the Smoky Mountains uh, project. Uh, let's see. Uh, at the lower right of the pie chart, you can see that the percentage of returning visitors is about 25 percent, and that the average bounce rate was about was 53.62 percent. So uh, people stayed in uh, for it at least five minutes and 13 seconds, or at least that's the average visit uh, duration for that. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some nice uh, graphics uh, for location here. Uh, probably it's no, not surprising that Tennessee had the most visits, uh, and uh, that was uh, 1,422 visits with Kentucky next. Uh, with 266, North Carolina, 201, Illinois, that surprised me, Ohio next with around 150, uh, Georgia, Florida uh, in the uh, low 100s, Indiana was an eighth, Alabama ninth, Michigan tenth, and California 11th, so that, that was pretty interesting. If you look at the next slide, we've got some international reach. Um, more than 3,000 visits were in the U.S. Uh, there was uh, there were 29 
uh, IP addresses that did not have a location. Uh, they were not in the tables we used. That was the next highest. 17 visits from Canada, uh, 16 from Australia, 15 from Germany, and then we had Ecuador as the sixth with uh, 13, I believe. On the next slide, uh, I have some uh, information. Oh, I'm sorry that you can't see that. Uh, these are top referrals by source. And the uh, one, the site that was the largest source of visits was togeton.net with 850 visits. Uh, then there's a, several from uh, UTK that were sources of visits. One of the uh, sources, the third highest source of visits, was a website containing geospatial data uh, of points of interest in East Tennessee, including the Great Smoky Mountains. Many uh, other sites were associated with hiking or the Great Smoky Mountains or history. The, uh, there's one site, ents-bbs.org, that's a bulletin board site for the Native Tree Society, which is, is kind of interesting. And then there was a real estate firm doing business in and around the Smokies that's listed on, on this site. Uh, so it, that's, uh, that's an interesting report to look at and slicing and dicing uh, with, different, with extra dimensions a little later. If you look at the next uh, this side, slide right here, we've got top search terms. There wasn't much searching during the time we're looking at now, but uh, the, high, the search term with the highest number of pages per visit was for Dutch Roth, about the fourth line down. There were three visits, but the pages per visit were over 100, and the average duration was 25 minutes. On to the next slide. We, this was generated by getting the data by content page listed in order by page view, number of page views. I then added a second dimension, the source. Where did the um, request to get onto this page come from? The first line is a, uh, the page is a digital image. And the source is a uh, site, togeton.net. Let's see what this image is that has so many different page views. If you go to the next slide. This is an image of Cumberland Falls in Kentucky. It's about 88 miles north of Knoxville and uh, not really related to the uh, Smoky Mountains, but was in this collection. And togeton.net hosted a website with something called a moonbow. And I, if you're interested, uh, send me an email, and I can let you know what a moonbow is. Let's go on to the next slide, Martha, please. Usage metrics and user satisfaction. We have visit information listed by metropolitan area. And again, excuse me for not being able to uh, see the detail information on this slide. In the column on the far right, what I did was computed or found the mile, miles from Knoxville. So the first site with no miles is Knoxville, Tennessee, then Nashville, Chattanooga, the Tri-Cities, Virginia. Nashville is 180 miles from Knoxville, and a round trip would be 360 miles. That could be a numeric representation of uh, energy saved uh, based on mileage for not having to drive to Knoxville for each visit. So that's an environmental value that could be looked at. If you look at the next page, we've added additional data uh, or additional data with uh, returning users. We've selected our data to only look at returning users, 
and with page per views greater than four. Again, by listed by metropolitan er, uh, area, and we have uh, computed or found the mileage from Knoxville, and we have computed an, a round trip cost uh, for a trip to Knoxville by doubling the mileage and then multiplying it by the fifty five and a half cents per mile that the government allows for mileage deduction. So, uh, for example, Chicago, Illinois, there were 23 visits. That's uh, $600.51 in miles per visit there. So one, if you needed to have a dollar value associated with, uh, with these visits, this, this might be something useful. If you go to my last slide, Martha, uh, I'm not going to read the, the Vol Vision value creation, but the University of Tennessee Knoxville has a goal of being uh, in uh, the list of top 25 public universities like UCLA, University of Michigan, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, et cetera. And this is an excerpt of the vision about outreach activities. And I believe we've uh, shown that the Roth image collection has benefited several communities and contributes to this vision and providing free online access to these vision or to these images is definitely in the realm of the public good. And thank you, Martha. Thank you. We have uh, a couple more questions. Uh, I know we are a little bit over time, but it's okay. We can, we'll probably go for about five more minutes. Uh, let's see. Jeremy Bueller from the University of British Columbia, he's asking who was invited to respond to the survey and how was it administered? The survey okay. was a pop-up survey uh, that came up when one entered the main entry page to the collections. And it was a pop-up survey. And if you're like me, I don't look at pop-ups. I disable them. So we don't know how many people went right through it. We do know we had several, visit, several visits from Google Analytics through that home, home page, and we got maybe uh, 30 people who, who, who said, go ahead and I'll look at the survey when we said, do you want to continue once they got into the survey? About half of them dropped off. Um, and so, just to intercept here, um, we did talk about doing an intercept survey, as I remember, Gail, and uh, it, it was the technical infrastructure. It was, it was right. technical it was, infrastructure that I did not have available to me. Yeah, that's us. But it is possible to do it as, a, as a, an intercept survey instead of a pop-up survey, it's just that yes. uh, in this case, yeah. Um, we, we do have uh, another question coming back to the option value that's uh, actually interesting uh, to, to consider. The option value seems similar to just in case, it says. A justification library is used in the past for our print collections. How do you well, think it's um, different? Mm -hmm. It probably isn't any different. Um, it, it's probably the same thing. Um, well, for those who are, who are the non-users, yes, uh, it's like the toolbox example. You have that tool in your box just in case you ever want to use it. And from an economic standpoint, it's precisely the same thing as, as a just-in-case. What we were attempting to do, of course, is to be able to to, de to uh, develop this contingent valuation where we could reach out and try to, to capture things like uh, like the prestige and like the Matthew effect on on uh, on building a collection, uh, on how it helps uh, a development officer bring in money. So w we started our survey with with, with sort of the, the the what we thought might have been the lower hanging fruit is the non user. Uh, so we we just identified the non user as the person who who wants it there for for whatever reason, and just in case. So I think uh, uh, your question is a good one in the sense that yeah. The just in case is really uh, the same thing as as the option value. Thank you, thank you, both of you. I do want to breeze through a couple of elements. 
on the ARL agenda that uh, special collections is a priority for ARL. We have a working group that looks into these issues, um, a working group that tries to identify opportunities and recommend actions that will encourage uh, concerted action uh, and coordinated planning for collecting and exposing old materials. Uh, that group also identifies criteria and strategies for collecting digital and other uh, new media material. Uh, the uh, uh, group has actually uh, focused on born digital special collections and uh, there is a spec kit we done in this area in 2012, managing born digital special collections and archival materials. And we have a series of workshops that are offered in collaboration with the Society of American Archivists uh, that are uh, happening throughout uh, the rest of 2013 and 2014. The, um, um, in relation to digitized special collections, uh, in 2010, the ARL board endorsed a set of nine principles to guide vendors and publisher relations in large-scale digitization projects of uh, special collections uh, materials. And in 2012, uh, we published a set of articles in our um, newsletter, the Research Library Issues newsletter, uh, on legal issues in digitizing special collections. Uh, there are collaborative research projects with ISAC SNR on sustainability of digitized special collections. And uh, we have uh, also um, done a couple of evidence-based approaches. We did collect qualitative profiles as part of the celebrating research volume uh, that uh, we put together um, a few years ago. Uh, celebrating the 75th anniversary of ARL. And starting last year, we started collecting some basic data, quantitative data, on expenditures and staffing for special collections. Uh, there seems to be a lot of interest for doing more systematic work in this area. If you are interested in pilot work, please let me know. We will be um, putting a toolkit together and soliciting uh, libraries to participate in different pilot activities uh, come next year. I would like to thank you for staying with us. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Martha. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martha. Thank you. This does conclude today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines this time and have a great day.